As we are gathering here on the unceded land of the Lenape peoples, I'd like to take a moment by paying respect to them and to Lenape elders and ancestors, past, present, and future. This afternoon's program is planned in conjunction with the exhibition Wageshimutu Intertwined, and if you have not seen it, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> it's on view now, uh, and I would really encourage you, if there's time after the program, to go up and see it. It's really spectacular, and we're all so thrilled for her. Today we're going to hear from curators and artists about how music, visual, and political practices intersect with Mutu's work, as well as their own. First up, we'll hear from the New Museum's very own Vivian Crockett and Margot Norton, co-curators of the Mutu exhibition. They will be in conversation for about 30 minutes with Trevor Schoonmacher, director of the National Museum in Durham, North Carolina. Trevor is a dear, dear friend, wink, 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 uh, as well as a colleague of mine and a longtime collaborator of Wageshi's. He included her work in his 2003 exhibition here at the New Museum when the New Museum was located down on Broadway. Um, the exhibition Black President, the Art and Legacy of Fela Anikulapo Kuti about the band leader, Afrobeat pioneer, and activist. And you'll see some of those images rotate uh, as Margot, Vivian, and Trevor speak this afternoon. And right after this, we'll hear from artists Sanford Biggers and DJ Reborn. Uh, this conversation will be moderated by the wonderful scholar Maureen Mayon for about 50 minutes. As a part of their conversation, Samford, DJ Reborn, and Maureen will play clips of music tracks that resonate from Mutu's work. While I would love to see you all get up and get your groove on, stay seated. You can, you can nod your heads and snap your fingers. At the end of this, we will open up uh, to, to all of you for questions. And then before we get started, I have a few thank yous, of course. I'd like to shout out the new museum team that makes these programs happen. Jenny Huo, Austin Bowes. Austin, where are you? I know you're in the house. Austin, Derek Wright, Derek in the back, and Althea Rockwell, our Director of Education and Public, Public Programs. Uh, and thank you to our, our marketing and digital team led by Sarah Bailey Hogarty. I gratefully, gratefully acknowledge the Bowery Council of the New Museum for its support of our education and public engagement programs. And thank you very much to our members and supporters, like so many of you, who help make these programs possible. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to pass things over to Vivian, Margot, and Trevor. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm super excited to be here with Trevor and Margot um, and with all of you. I can't believe it's almost two weeks until the show closes, it's a bit surreal. Um, this was the first big project I got to work on since starting at the New Museum and it's been amazing to collaborate with Margot who has been here for so long and has worked on so many projects and um, I had last seen Trevor's, you know, large scale Wangechi survey about 10 years ago. Um, I went to see it over and over and over again. I couldn't get enough of that show. And so having the opportunity to see where Wangechi is now 10 years since that moment has been really special. And when we decided to do the show, we really weren't planning for it to coincide with the 20th anniversary of this exhibition, but very serendipitously, it has coincided with the 20th anniversary of Black President, which was a show that Wangeshi Mutu was part of. And so it's really exciting to think about the, the presence of music in Wangeshi's work, which is very evident in her references, her visual references, as well as in her titles. There's so many song titles that uh, we see in her work to the point where we would have songs in our head as we're um, getting the checklist together. So it's really a treat to be in dialogue with you, Trevor, and to speak a little bit about this great project. Trevor, 
Trevor for being in conversation with us. I think Vivian and I kind of first became uh, familiar with Von Getschy's work around the time that the Black President exhibition was on view at the New Museum, um, which Trevor curated. But Trevor, I think it's quite remarkable that you've had such a long history kind of knowing Wang Geshi's work and working with her kind of dating even before the New Museum exhibition and, you know, kind of all, all the way up until the present. Um, and I would love to kind of start the conversation speaking a bit about that relationship um, and also about if you could just start with when you first encountered her work and, um, yeah, and then and, and on from there. Okay, uh, yeah, happy to. First of all, um, thank you for having me. It's uh, a pleasure to be back at the New Museum. And uh, shout out to both of you and congratulations on it. And a remarkable show. I'll just reiterate what Isolde said. If you have not seen it, you must go see it. Uh, it is a monumental exhibition um, and a massive undertaking. So congrats on that. Um, Wageshi and I met uh, around 99, 2000, when she was finishing um, her MFA at Yale. And she was living in the city, so she was sort of commuting back and forth. Um, and uh, Isolde and I met years ago uh, because we were two of very few people studying contemporary African art in the 90s. Um, it was an unbelievably small field at that time. And we had a mutual friend who put us in touch. And once I moved to New York in 98, um, I worked, the first place I worked was Max Protech Gallery on 22nd Street, which is no longer there, of course. And the director there, Josie, said, you should know, oh, you're interested in contemporary art. You should meet Wageshi Mutu. I said, oh, I don't know her. Um, and I, she was installing a show at, um, at uh, oh my gosh, Rush Arts which at that time, the amazing artist, Derek Adams, was the director of and running. And um, I walked over there, she was installing, it was supposed to open, I think the next day, and she was painting the floor. And, I was, and we hit it off, we talked for a while, and she, the next day, you know, so she was turning it into an environment. She had all her work there, sculpture and video, and um, coming out of grad school, and, uh, but she was creating this environment. And, the next day, the floor was all tacky. <laughs> like she, it, there's no way it was going to dry in time. But she knew she wanted to transform the space. Like she was not just going to bring her work into a space and have it be some other space. She was going to make it her own. And so she really, uh, she really began in that in that way. And I mean, I can talk more about it, but it it has led to uh, there was evidence in that show of everything that she's done thereafter, essentially. And then we did a show, yeah. I was going to say, um, that was one of the, the exciting things about proposing a show at the New Museum, knowing that the New Museum historically has been an, an institution that has let artists have free reign. And um, I've seen all kinds of transformations of the space. And, you know, we like to call our shows introspectives um, in this way that you get to inhabit an artist's world. And one guess she has absolutely done that in this um, undertaking here. And I did want to talk about this other project that you had done with Wangeshi prior to the Black President, because I think it, of course, ties in um, very nicely, of course, his interest in music and the show that you did called The Magic City, which was inspired um, by the title of a Sun Ra album. Could you talk uh, a little bit about Wangeshi's sure. involvement yeah, in that, 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 was, that yeah. project? Yeah, thank you. Um, that was a show in the summer of 2000. Uh, I was then working at a uh, was called Brent Sycama before it was Sycama Jenkins. And um, they let me curate a summer show because you could do no harm, because at that time, so and no one curated summer shows. Everybody just left town, like the art world shut down. They're like, you can curate a show. You won't mess anything up. And she was one of six artists who I invited after meeting her at, at Rush Arts and hitting it off and um, getting to know her. Um, Barkley Hendricks, Susan Hendricks is with us tonight. Um, Barkley Hendricks was one of the artists. Roberta Vizani, Tony Gray. Rena Banerjee and Tim Evans. Um, but bringing Wageshi's work in, it was this small sort of ritual sculptures that she was creating at that time. It was performance video. Um, there's a little sculpture of, um, she had a, one of her, her first dripping bottle um, uh, with India ink in it at the time. And, it, and we, we put down what we thought was sealant on the floor. Um, didn't work and we permanently stained the floor with India ink. So she left her mark there also. <laughs> Um, but that was a great experience, um, and we just we kind of bonded from there uh, moving forward. I love the um, 
so far the references of what one guess she was doing to floors of museums i'm sure you, you you've seen all the interventions that she's done to our museum too and you know staining the walls and gouging the walls and um yeah it's uh it's something that's been a part of her practice since the beginning um and kind of going back to the magic city for a moment was that your first show that was kind of around a musician in that way Oh yeah, that was my first um, contemporary art exhibition. I, I had curated um, collections of traditional African art prior in, in grad school, but that was my first. That was my first show period, really, honestly. And um, but music's always been inspiration for me. When I got out of uh, college, my first job was working in an independent record store, and so I've just always been immersed in music. Um, so Sun Ra, yeah, definitely an influence for that show, and of course, just the Magic City not only being um, where, you know, um, Birmingham, Alabama, but like the center of the civil rights movement. So there are all these connections between social justice and music and inspiration and community building. And so all those things were sort of coming in, into play in that show. Uh, it's a very small show, but like I said, there was no competition, so it got a lot of reviews. And I thought, well, I can do this. Um, and, and then kind of segueing into Black President, i um, curious about um, the decision to focus on Fela for an exhibition in 2003. Um, you know, 20 years ago, this is like on the heels of the golden age of hip hop. And I'm just thinking about like what it meant to revisit Fela's music in that moment um, and what it was that, you know, kind of your desire to, to do that then. And if you could just share a little bit also about the kind of general um, organization of the show, how many artists, uh, kind of how it came about, all of that, as you speak to that. Happy to. Um, so the show, um, first of all, thank you to the New Museum again for taking a chance on that show in particular, but it was a very specific moment. I had lived in Nigeria in 92, so many years prior, and then uh, in grad school lived in Ghana, and um, and so I'd been kind of immersed in Fela since around 1990, and um, and I just want to recognize two people in the audience. One is Peter Orlov, who um, co-curator of the music library and listening program in the exhibition, Black President, with me. And, and Sanford Bigger is one of the artists in the show also. And I thought Odilia Dita might be here too. But um, anyway, there's a, there's a lot of um, Black President uh, representation. Um, the show came about just, of course, from living in Nigeria and that kind of uh, inspiration. But it was a very particular moment at that time where all these things were converging. So um, DJ Reborn, Rich Medina, people were spinning Afrobeat. You know, as Rich said, he was sort of uh, sneaking it into hip hop sets and house sets. And then slowly we built up um, what became a club night because I, um, when I was trying to propose Black President, I had no contacts in the art world. I didn't really, outside of meeting artists, which I felt adept at and connecting with, I didn't have any I didn't know any people within the museum community. Um, so I was like, well, I better throw a party because I got all these artists on board and I better get people together. This is pre-social media, so there's really no other way. We got to get bodies in a space. And um, um, Debbie Seeley, Rich Medina, and I threw a party and uh, afterwards, and I was screening bootleg documentary footage and selling t-shirts and passing out literature and all these friends, as old and Peter and others were helping out and we we're all dancing. Um, and at the end, everybody says, when's the next one? And I said, there's no next one. And Rich says, monthly. We're doing it monthly. <laughs> so I became a monthly club night promoter for two years. Um, and when the show opened, to, that was 2001, summer of 2001. And when this show opened in summer of 2003, um, everyone who'd been dancing at Jumpin' Funk is as old as nodding her head. And Samford and Peter and uh, um, everyone came to the opening. Because honestly, in Lacey, and it was, it was our party. It wasn't just... It wasn't just the artists and the lenders and the donors. Um, it was a community. And it was a massive fire hazard, and it was amazing. But they threw open the doors, and everybody came in. But there were, oh gosh, 30-something artists. It was, um, it was a miracle that it happened, because um, Lisa Phillips, to her credit, Dan Cameron, when he was a curator here, to his credit, they gave me a chance. They had no idea who I was. Most people didn't know who Fela was. Thankfully, Dan did. Um, they didn't, you know, most people didn't know 90% of the artists in the show at that time. And so it was a huge leap of faith, but that was the spirit of the new museum. And 
So it was a wonderful opportunity and Wageshi making new work for the show, among others. So I'm sure all of you are seeing this slideshow behind us, those who can, um, where you see the work that Wageshi made for this exhibition, which is Yo Mama. It's a work that's really kind of central in our exhibition if you're starting on the second floor, which is what we recommend as you go up the stairs. <laughs> Make another plug for that. Um, but we're... Um, very struck by the fact that Wangeshi decided to focus on Fumilayo, Fila's mother, um, rather than focus on Fila um, himself as a subject of her work. And I think there's been this kind of core of a feminist praxis also in Wangeshi's work and, you know, wanting to say that one that um, Fela got this from his mama. So calling the work Yo Mama at a time when Yo Mama is a very kind of disparaging thing. You know, Yo Mama so this, Yo Mama so that. It's like Your Mama's so radical. Your Mama's so creative. Your Mama's such an important figure in your life and your mama made you who you are. I think that was so incredible. And so I feel like with the time that we have left, we need to talk about Fela as a figure, like what he represents, the fact that he was, you know, not a respectable figure as much as people chose to take different parts of his life and his legacy and kind of ignore the rest. There was a lot there. And I feel like the curatorial text for that show really leaned into all the aspects, the complicated aspects of his practice as well. And I think many of the artworks as well dealt with some of those themes. So I would love to hear a little bit about your approach to that, your interest in looking at him as a figure and yeah, how you approach to that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think you start off with the fact that obviously Fellow is an inspirational revolutionary figure, but complicated and not controversial and, and not um, full of conflict even within. And the fact that if you're speaking to Fela, your mama is a revolutionary. Your mama is a leader of the liberation movement. Your mama is a leader of the women's rights movement in Nigeria. So it comes from all of that, um, from within that context and setting up his own compound, Calicuta Republic, and marrying 28 women, 27 in one ceremony. Um, that also deeply complicated. Um, it wasn't, it, it was both incredibly patriarchal and also a, a way of um, validating these women's existence because they weren't seen, they're living on the margins of society in many ways. And so, and, there, and there's a great essay by Lorraine Denzer and the other compendium of essays, um, a fellow from West Africa to West Broadway, where she wrote really eloquently about this, where it wasn't, it was a double, it was both sides of the coin that he actually validated um, them by saying, you're my, you're my wives, you're my queens, you're not, concubines or or what you know the way people women were portrayed um but the but the exhibition uh, you know is really important to have obviously feminist perspective from wageshi and sokari douglas camp and sanama kujeto and sanam rift on um on uh, uh uh adrian piper's funk lessons and did afro funk lessons and she brought in yemesi kuti fella's cousin to teach afrobeat um, to a group in Switzerland, and it was amazing. So there are all these little subtle um, critiques within the show, but him as a spiritualist, as, as a revolutionary, and obviously the music, I mean, those, those elements, and, and this idea of Pan-African thought, which is really what, um, you know, we use different terminology today, and like language changes faster than, than we can respond to, or actually language is slower, excuse me, but... Um, I think those those are like the key elements, and um, Wageshi, I think it was just so telling that when she said, yeah, I want to be in the show, I love Fela. She had actually made a small collage about Fela before. but that a she, reproduction in the vitrine on the second floor. That's right. Yeah, yes, go see it, go see it. But that she chose, she's like, my work's going to be about Fumilaya, because everything, as you know, Wageshi does is from a feminist perspective, from a female perspective. And, and so, uh, yeah, I don't know if there's anything... And I was curious about some of the other artists' responses. Um, like, were they, I mean, I assume like most of them were commissions probably like around this theme. Um, were there some that surprised you? Were there some that, you know, uh, challenged perhaps like some of the ideas, you know, about Fela? Um, and yeah, just if you could talk a little bit of that. Yeah, I mean, everyone had their own perspective. So like when I sat down with Alfredo Jar, he's he said, well, intellectually I am a member of the Calicuta Republic. That that's where I live. That's where I reside. Um clearly he lives in New York. Um but but 
it's being able to sit down with someone like that or someone like Olu Aguibe who lived through it, right, and and get that kind of perspective. But then someone like Sakari Douglas Camp, and I think her her sculpture is in one of the images, and she had a, one of his wives as a dancer, as a queen, as a performer um, with his uh, amazing entourage um, and wrote AIDS across across the forehead because the story is, of course, of, of Fela perishing from AIDS, but how many of of the queens, how many of his wives um, also suffered. And so I, I think there are those that, you know, everyone presented it to me in advance, but I, it was it was just such a please bring in those elements to the conversation. It wasn't, it wasn't a let's just um, elevate fella and celebrate this person who everyone, everyone is complicated. <laughs> Fellow is deeply, deeply complicated. And I do want to pause on that, this idea that Sokari focused on that, because I think the discourse then, and still a lot of the discourse focuses largely on queer communities, but of course AIDS and HIV has impacted various communities, and I feel like women are especially invisibilized in that discourse, and people who are you know, so-called straight identifying in, in that context are also taken out of that narrative. So I think the new museum already had a history of engaging with that legacy and was very much part of that conversation in the late eighties and nineties. And so bringing that element into that space was really, I think, crucial. And one of the works that stood out to me, um, as I was I can, revisiting I this. Yes. Yeah. So incredible. You had some thoughts on IK. Did you want to share anything about? Oh, well, I mean, I mean, IK, uh, IK Ude, um, his presence was really important in the show because I think, you know, him living in Nigeria, he already felt like he was on the margin. He already felt like he was like, he and Olu really like, um, you know, they talk about it like they're rude boys. And so um, he's like some other, you know, colleagues less so. And like, you know, fellow is really um, you know, um, a threat to the establishment, a threat to the status quo, a threat to, um, the bourgeoisie, a threat to, you know, middle class, frankly, uh, obviously the upper class and, and anything, any, and anyone in power. So coming from that position, um, I got immersed in it because, uh, when I lived there is with, a um, a family who's part of my family, um, uh, the Duratoyes and, and Yomi Duratoye is a political scientist and, um, so having all these conversations with him really was incredibly illuminating. Um, yeah, I've lost my train of thought. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I wanted to ask about the component of music and video that entered the exhibition. Um, you mentioned that Piotr like, worked on the, the listening station um, and what it meant to have those elements as a part of the exhibition. Um, you know, was it something the art world was used to seeing? Um, was it, uh, you know, embraced? How did people feel to like, kind of include those, you know, videos of Fela or that music as a part of the show? It was, once it was on view, I think people got it and it was fully embraced and people were at the music library all the time listening because it was a, it was a, it was a timeline. We called a library instead of a listening station because it was like the music that predated Fela that led up that he built upon. Everyone stands on someone else's shoulders. And and then the music that was um, at the same time sort of synergistically with him, and then those that he inspired going into the future. And 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 Peter and I uh, worked diligently on that listening. We had to actually listen to CDs and vinyl to you know make this thing. It was a different era, um, but way more fun, way more fun. Um, but it, but now we have a Spotify playlist. That's which right. Also listen to. That's so, right. You know, things change, but. But it, but it's true that at the time, um, even the concept for the show was revolutionary. For the, so again, shout out to the New Museum for embracing it because the idea that you're, why would you do a show about a musician? It made no sense. It seems crazy today. Oh, you can do a show about anything. Um, but 20 years ago or 20 plus when it was being proposed, there are so many questions from people you wouldn't even expect to be raising the question. He said, a show about a musician having music, I don't, it doesn't really make sense. What, how's that gonna work and, and why? Um, but then you have people like Sanford in here actually are musicians. So there, there are so many connections in the show um, around, and it's critical. Like you could not have a show about Fela Kuti and not have music present. And there is a documentary, uh, Music is the Weapon, screening uh, that people could sit down and watch that kind of context 
Um, it had to be an, um, an immersive kind of space. And if you didn't have that musical context, I don't think the show would make any sense. Is that what, like the video of Fela? This yes, thing? yeah, so that, that's the Music is the Weapon um, documentary screening uh, room, and then we had literature, there's what Geishi's work. Um, yeah, and then we had great, I mean, we had great panels and parties, and um, Rich Media never, he's still doing jump and funk, um, very much so. How are we doing on time? We got about five minutes. Does anyone want to ask any quick questions? I know we're breaking a little bit with protocol, but we have a couple of minutes to spare. Um, sure. Sorry, keeping keeping everyone on their toes. <laughs> <laughs> for the archive, as we say. Hi, thank you so much for this panel. My name is Michelle Love in Queens. And um, I just wanted to ask more about the um, perspective of Pan-Africanism um, from you, um, Trevor, because I think it's really fascinating that you lived in two different countries during the time that you did in the 90s. So if you could kind of shed light on like Wangeshi's connectivity with Fela through the Pan-Africanist perspective, because I agree with you, it's incredibly revolutionary, especially for that time. That would be great. And thank yeah. you, Ashton. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, we, we we were just talking about Pan Africanism and the diaspora in the context of Wageshi specifically, and and in relationship to music. And I was just saying to Margot and Vivian how when the Fugees came out, Wageshi was like, "That's that's it. That's like I'm hearing I'm hearing diaspora. I'm hearing Pan Africanism. I'm hearing all these things in hip hop now, and it's literally there. Um, you know, the fact that she went from Kenya to the UK to New York, um, and then felt always these works, even the work here, even with Fumila, it's a diptych, it's like a foot in two worlds, and that kind of um, dichotomy that she was always bridging different worlds, and, and is very much so today. She, she's Nairobi to New York today. And um, so that's always been there. It's always been such a huge part, and, and all of her work is, is an embracement of, um, an embracing of, of this sense of hybridity um, and, and togetherness, uh, even more so, like interconnectedness. So everything is pan, and everything is multi <laughs> for Wageshi. Yeah. Her beings are pan. Everything is pan. I think there's this kind of fluidity overall. And, yeah, in our conversations with Wageshi and in, in the conversation we did in the book, there's a segment that we talk about the kind of importance of Fela for Wangeshi and especially as a migrant person, like the way that he was read, the way that she was feeling legible and illegible in these different ways was a huge part of her attraction to him as well. Yeah, I just wanted to mention a great quote that Wangeshi said in Aruna D'Souza's profile in the New York Times. She like opens up with this quote where she talks about having roots in multiple places, almost like a mangrove tree. And I love that because I feel like you know, yeah, she was speaking specifically to her experiences in Nairobi and New York and how and how she feels so connected to so many places that way. Yeah, and for us, our attraction to Wangashi's practice at large and in the show is about the kind of specificity of it, the much how much it's rooted in her own cultural experiences and the histories that she has, you know, been privy to in her own life, but also there's an entry point for so many other people and there's this kind of transcultural element there's a very kind of Pan-Africanist diasporic quality to all of her work. And um, we're so happy to be able to share this moment with you and celebrate the show in this way, because yeah, your relationship with Wangashi has been really beautiful to watch as an art experiencer in the world. Um, yeah, and we can't wait to see what, you, you continue to work with Wangashi. And um, I know she, she was recently in one of your projects, if you wanna share just a little bit about that. and. Sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I know we've got to, we got to move forward. Um, yeah. Uh, there's a show currently on view that I organized at the Nasher called Spirit in the Land and it's a 30 artist exhibition and, and we'll get, she has work in that. Um, we commissioned one of her giant bronzes, Mama Ray, that's on view permanently at the, at the Nasher Museum at Duke in Durham. Um, I, just like with Barclay Hendrix, uh, I tend to, if I really, and, and uh, Delio Dito just walked in, and um, it, i not trying to put you on the spot. <coughs> Spotlight. You're, you're on time. <laughs> um, the, the, um, 
I love working with, I love developing a relationship. Sanford and I are going to do a talk together in just a couple of weeks. I, I love building on things and continuing to build and, and being a part of that, their journey and, um, and, and being able to grow together. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we want to try to keep things rolling and pick up some of the threads from this wonderful conversation that we just heard. And um, I want to start by thanking Alethea Rockwell and Austin Bowes for inviting me to moderate this panel um, and to thank uh, DJ Reborn, Robin Rogers, and um, Sanford Biggers for agreeing to, to share the stage. Um, so when I, I just want to give a, a very quick couple of introductory remarks and then we'll jump in to conversation and, and some listening. Um, so when curators Vivian Crockett and Margot Norton invited me to contribute to the exhibition catalog for Wageshimutu Intertwined, I was delighted, but I was also confused because I typically write about music and musicians, not visual art and artists, and they assured me that this was okay and they encouraged me to write from where I was and discuss connections that I saw between Mutu's pieces and the African-American women uh, vocalists whom I research. So thank you for that invitation. Um, it's the first time I've ever done anything outside of music, uh, music writing. And it was a really fun experience. But also having spent more time with the beautiful exhibition of uh, Wageshi's work that Vivian and Margot have uh, curated, I realized that what they were asking me to do was to echo the kind of boundary crossing that is typical of Wageshi Mutu's art. Um, and, and I'll just encourage you again, if you haven't uh, seen the work in the show, to go, go, go. Um, you'll see works um, that, that work across mixed media, collage, sculpture, and video art to imagine otherwise and to create the fantastical hybrid figures and environments that are the signatures of her practice. And so this afternoon, as I said, we're going to continue in the spirit of making connections and crossing boundaries and intertwining uh, and have a conversation about the visual and the sonic by calling on two stalwarts in their respective fields who are well acquainted with Wageshi and her work. Uh, and we're going to ask them to talk about connections between musical, visual, and political practices in their, in their creative work and also in Wageshi's work. Um, and just to frame our discussion, I wanted to share a quote from Wageshi that appears in an essay by the late great writer, cultural critic, and musician Greg Tate, also my brother-in-law. Um, so, and this is a piece that he wrote um, for Wageshi, um, Wageshi Mutu, A Fantastic Journey, a catalog that came out 10 years ago. And this is Wageshi, she says, quote, at an early age, I understood that I wanted to do things creatively, engage with people, look at things that were seen as unconventional, travel, experiment. But, to my, but my first love wasn't art. It was music. I took classes at school and learned how to read music and play the flute. I loved to sing and make up dance routines in front of my mirror. I would paint my face, dress up, create weird alternate personas for my own personal music class. I knew I was a bit of an oddball, but not so much in school, more in my family. So that's her thoughts. And I, I wanted us to have that in our mind as we started talking a in a conversation um, about the early important of music, importance of music to her, um, to this incredibly gifted artist, and you know, just to think about the connections across and between the, the different arts. Um, 
To that end, there is a Spotify list. I think Vivian just mentioned that. A Spotify list connected to this panel that you can explore. And then we also asked Robin and Sanford to bring some songs that we're going to listen to um, over the course of the conversation um, that they feel maybe connect to the exhibit, to Wageshi, and to, just to these questions of politics, art, and uh, images. Um, so I just want to start by asking you each to introduce yourselves. Start with Robin. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your creative practice, and also let us know when and how uh, you first crossed paths with Wageshi. Um, good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Um, as Maureen said, my uh, professional name is DJ Reborn. <laughs> Robin, very few people know my name is Robin and definitely don't know my last name. So thank you for dropping my government. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, I uh, am a professional DJ. I've been DJing now for 31 years. Um, I started DJing as a hobby and a way for me to express my deep passion for music. Music has saved my life, quite literally, um, since childhood. Um, and records, right? Like albums, album artwork, liner notes. Those were my first interactions with things that felt like visual work to me. I mean, they were visual work, but records in my house, my parents didn't necessarily have a, a, an art collection, but they had records, which meant that they had an art collection. Um, and so I was deeply fascinated with album art. Um, I loved vinyl ever since I can remember. Um, always played music, always loved DJs, was super fascinated by how DJs could transform space with sound um, and selection. Um, I started DJing for fun and to express that. And um, if my trembling voice and beating heart don't let you know I'm a little bit shy. Um, and so DJing was a way for me to communicate who I am, um, who I've been, what I believe in. Um, and when I saw the importance of what DJing actually is, people think that DJing is someone playing songs. And that's true, um, but it's spirit work. And when people are on a dance floor having a collective experience, um, that warms them up. Or when people are walking out of the door and they come to the DJ booth and they say, I've been trying to leave for an hour <laughs> and you won't let me go. Or you played this song and it reminded me of my grandmother. Thank you so much. Um, so I think it's really important to elevate the craft that I've chosen to be my life's work um, and to honor it in that way. I am a vessel for the work, um, Trevor mentioned standing on people's shoulders. There have always been women DJs. I love these, I love the girls who had just started DJing in like 2015 and being like, when I started, there was no women. Girl, what? <laughs> anyway, people do your research. That's all I'm saying. So anyway, <laughs> um, now how I met Wangeshi is a little trickier because Brooklyn is very blurry, right? <laughs> New York is blurry. You don't remember how you know people, you just know people. And you're just like, uh, where did we meet again? I don't remember how our paths crossed, but we have kindred energy. Um, I'm pretty into astrology and Wangeshi is a cancer like me. Um, so we just really bonded. And I was deeply honored when, after becoming a fan of her work, um, she asked me to DJ her wedding and um, various important points in her life and career, she called me in to do the soundtrack. So when she and her husband and their daughters left New York, they had a surprise going away party and I got to DJ that. And it's just such an honor to play music for an artist like Wangeshi um, because her work means so much to me. And I relate to what seems to be her process, right? Of how she puts things together that seemingly don't go together. How she transitions, right? DJs, we, we mix, right? We crossfade, we blend, we beat match if we're good. <laughs> um, and Wangeshi is basically a visual DJ, right? Um, she DJs visually as far as I can tell. So I feel like um, our practice of how we make things is similar. Um, so that's me, hi. Did I answer your question? You did. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Sanford Biggers, a conceptual artist originally from Los Angeles, but I've been in New York for uh, 
a long time now. Um, and uh, my practice is interdisciplinary. I work between painting, video, sculpture, sound, performance. Um, and before I even get into Wageshi, I'll talk about Robin. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, yes. I'll leave the government out. Um, yes, it is blurry. It's all very blurry. But the only reason I bring it up now is because I think we may have actually first met in San Francisco before we both were in New York City. So that's the only reason I don't get stuck in the malaise of uh, New York for that. Yeah, with Martin Luther. Okay, so got that out of the way. Oh, and then I did the Whitney Biennial in 2002 and I had an after party and Robin was my DJ. And when and my wedding reception when I got married in 2017. So we go back. Um, and Wageshi as well. I, now that gets a little blurrier, but I know around the time we met and that would have been, I was, um, an artist in resident at the Studio Museum in Harlem in 99. I believe she was 2000 or 2001. I think it was 2000. So she was the year right after me. And I think we either met through there or Brett Cook Disney, who also had a huge loft down the street on uh, 126 uh, near the Milk Studios. And he used to have a block party with various DJs, including Rich Medina, who we've been talking about a lot this evening, uh, this afternoon as well. Uh, so it could have been through that or also the music scene. We were both, uh, Afropunk did a documentary that featured myself, Wageshi, and Baron Claiborne around 2010, 2011 or so. So I don't remember ever having a factual conversation about music with her, but music has always been sort of at, you know, at the bottom of our relationship, even more so than art. We always would be at music functions and dancing, and then there would be a sidebar art conversation. But um, all that to say that she's one of my favorite artists, and this is one of my favorite shows. You guys killed it. This is incredible. This is soul food. Um, this exhibition is the reason that I go see DJ Reborn and the reason I go see DJ Rich Medina, because my soul gets fed from this type of work and the many different places, zones, and hemispheres that all that work comes from and goes to and speaks to. Um, I think her work has everything. It hits all the notes. So, so I wonder if maybe we could take a little time, I'm not sure if you'll have a response to this question, um, but do you, do you see, when you look at Wageshi's work, do you see her being in dialogue with certain musical styles or specific artists? Is that something that registers with you? And I don't know what we have up on, we have back to your mama. Um, but if not, we can, we can move. You know, it's a, it's a hard question. It's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship. I can see a piece of her work and, be, and it will remind me of a song, whether she knows about that song or not. But I think that is actually really one of the trademarks of great art, art meaning music or visual art or whatever it may be, is that it can speak to so many different things and it can transcend time, generations, uh, nations, all of that. Um, it lives in a much higher realm, a much higher realm that can communicate and syncretize beyond cognition or even legibility or our ability to speak on it, you know, sort of ephemeral that way. Um, when you listen to the songs I selected, I'll go into that a little bit more mm -hmm. because I get inspiration from, I get various energies, various energies from different pieces, from different um, moments in her career. And Obviously, a lot of that is going through my own lens too. Um, but I can, you know, say that this is sort of, you know, this exhibition is the kind of exhibition that makes you want to go home and start working again. Um, when I go to one of your sets, it's like, you know, I always come to the booth and like, you know, I don't know that one right there. Tell me about it, then I go home, you know, and you know, gestate on it for a bit. So um, I think her work is almost like a playlist, an endless playlist, because you know, on a different day, I'll get a different song from a different piece. Um, so I wanted to ask, I also wanted to find out from both of you um, if there are ways that sounds and images from Africa and the African diaspora inform what you do, because I, obviously I think that's a part of uh, Wageshi's practice and also beyond that er those areas, but I wanted to, to focus specifically on that. So if there are any um, 
you know, sounds or images that help you do what you do that are coming from the, uh, from the diaspora? I mean, all of them, all of the images <laughs> that have ever crossed my eyes of people that look like me um, from the continent. Uh, I keep a picture on my, I have a record room and a music room in my house, thankfully, and um, on my DJ setup, I have a photo. I don't, I think I found it on the street or at a flea market early in my newly moved to Brooklyn days. Um, no, actually, I got it in the Bay at the flea market. Um, but it's sort of a faded image of an Af African woman. I don't know where she's from, which country, um, with a child. And she's glorious because, duh. And, um, and it's just a very sweet picture. But I like that it's faded. And it, I don't know the story of it. But it's just I look down at it. And it sits right next to my turntables. Um, and it's just something that. I always need to see. I've carried it with me through apartments and different places I've lived, and it's just, it means something to me. And so when I start my my own practice or when I'm going over sets or I'm, I'm curating a playlist or preparing for a show, that image is kind of the, the thing that I always go to, and it helps guide me in what I'm going to play. Um, and that's, you know, that's just one thing, you know? That's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, again, I've traveled through various countries, but, um, you know, I think a good word to describe my relationship with things from Africa in general is complicated. A lot of it is idealized. A lot of it is um, trying to find sort of a historical definition of who we are in the U.S., but not having the full story and having to make up parts of it or glean parts of it or get handed down, uh, passed down you know, messages of parts of it. So when I look at uh, Wageshi's work, I don't think specifically of Africa. I think it comes from there and it goes so far beyond, which is a good thing for all of us. Um, I think that somehow answers your question. I th wait, wait, can you <laughs> reword it? Because I know I had one specific thought that was very related to it. Oh, well, that really was, yeah. that was the question, but was, are there ways sounds and images from Africa and the diaspora inspire? Yeah, yeah. I think it, it definitely comes from there. That's the nucleus. But then it expands and just blossoms into something a lot more. Mm -hmm. uh, again, transcendent work can do that. You know, it may be rooted someplace, but it seems to branch off to others. Um, so I want to just get you to talk a little bit more about your practice and your process in your work. And Rob, um, Reborn, I'll start <laughs> with you. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you put a set, because I've, I've had the pleasure of dancing to your sets. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you conceptualize your sets when you're DJing? And maybe this would be a moment if you want to include, if you want to mention one of the songs that you brought to share with us. Sure, yeah. Um, actually, maybe we can, well, actually, I know how I want to do this. Um, OK, so uh, my process is contingent on what it is I'm preparing for. But the architecture of it or the skeleton of it is kind of the same, which is now that I, well, sorry, let me back up. I still use vinyl as well as work with um, today's technology. I work with a pro program called Serato. So I use my laptop with digital music files and then can still manipulate turntables or a DJ controller or CDJs um, to mimic the realness of mixing vinyl. Um, so now that I primarily work from that program um, and I have tens of thousands of songs in my computer, um, I usually start with whatever the theme is of what it is I'm doing. So just for example, um, I, uh, I opened for Lauren Hill and so depending on where we go to perform, like when we were in Brazil, I, I mean, and I already love Brazilian music, but I just did more research on what was like current for the folks in Brazil that I thought that they would appreciate so that as a nod of respect to where we were, like I'm not gonna come on top of you and do my DJ set the way I would do it without the consideration of the environment that I'm in, the soil that I'm on, and the people and the language. 
Um, so I like to make sure that I'm honoring whatever that means. Um, but last week we were doing a show in Atlanta. So I was like, well, Atlanta, okay, theme, got it. Um, but it doesn't mean I was gonna play only songs from Atlanta, but then the way my mind works, I'm like, all right, I have to do these very specific shouts to ATL that are very like, if you're from there, it's gonna mean something. Um, and then I have to think about women immediately and in conjunction with that first thought um, and how to represent us in the sound. Um, so that's always my order of business. Um, and then I uh, compile a huge playlist. Um, there's a function in Serato called Prepare and um, I load my ideas into that first and then I could have, I don't know, 500 songs in the starting playlist and then I will go back through and practice like how they will fit together right DJing is it's like sonic puzzle pieces right you have to fit the right ones together to make the picture clear um, so I go through and kind of see like what can fit with what and then I edit out I'll go back through okay I don't need this I don't need this I don't need that and then I just sort of try to get as granular as possible with the final selections I'm constantly over prepared, which then means that when I go to play, I have too many things to choose from. Um, so I'm really working on my editing process. Right now it's super sloppy, um, but it still works. Um, and I like that foundational preparation because then I often go off script, right? It gives me, it affords me the malleability to not stick to that list because I already know it's there and I can fall back on it if I need to. And so my job is to prepare, but then when I get into a room with actual humans and bodies and energy, um, I have to you know, feel it out because maybe that list will not work at all with the energy in the room. Um, so I prepare in order to um, improvise. And did you wanna Oh yeah, music. Listen, have us listen to something. I forgot about music. Um, all right, so uh, I was telling Maureen and Sanford and anyone that would listen that picking just a few songs is quite difficult, um, especially when I'm thinking about Wageshi, her work. I know how much she loves so many different kinds of music. Um, she's a true B-girl. And I mean that outside of just hip hop too. Like a B-girl to me is a B-girl. Like we love all of the right things that are soulfully bound. Um, so, uh, one of the songs that I would like to play the snippet of now, um, is by, uh, I want to shout out so many women. Um, there are a lot of really unsung Afrobeat artists, not Afrobeats with an S, because that's today's version. We could talk about that later. Afrobeat, um, historically, and you know, Fela is obviously the most well-known Afrobeat artist, um, and he's the patriarch of the genre, but there were so many women involved from its inception and before. Um, some of those women, so the song, one of the songs that I chose for today is by the Lejado sisters. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Those that know, know. Um, but they were twin sisters. They are twin sisters. One of them passed away sadly in 2019. Um, but just phenomenal Nigerian women, um, incredible singers. Um, and part of the foundation of the Afrobeat sound that we primarily know from Fela, but they were they were there too. Oh, and they were his cousins as well. Oh. So yeah, there's that. Uh, so I don't know where the music is being queued up from. That's usually my job, but <laughs> so I think Dan, yeah, you can you can play yeah from the beginning yeah just that little intro. Bubble in the streets. Watch out! Right, Jambai's on the way. Get out, fight, trouble in the streets. Watch out, right, Jamba is out to stay.
yeah, like I love playing this. And Trevor mentioned Rich talking about sneaking Afro beat into hip hop sets. Um, I was doing something similar early on. Um, and one of my most formative sort of ways that I think I was able to make an impression before I moved to New York was I came here to visit and I wanted to see if I could move here with the intention of DJing full time. And uh, thankfully the, the wonderful DJ Cool Marv, who I see sitting against the wall over there, I'm gonna embarrass him, fellow Cancerian. Uh, so Cool Marv is someone that you all should know. He's an incredible music historian and DJ, um, sound collage artist in his own right. And before I moved to New York, um, Marv used to make these mixtapes. You guys can get them online, they're amazing. But um, my boyfriend at the time in the Bay, who's from New York, played some Cool Marv for me. And Cool Marv had his phone number written on the mixtape because 1990 whatever. Um, and, uh, and so I called the number and left a message and he called me back. I don't know this man. We spoke for like an hour and I was like, I'm thinking about coming to New York to be a DJ. He was so generous with his time, with his information, with his connections. Um, and he's been around since I've known Wangeshi too and knows Wangeshi's work and just, I'm sorry, I just had to shout you out, Marv. Um, but when I came here, <laughs> when I came here, um, I was doing a show. I somehow got myself to DJ for a little bit at CBGB's down the block, which no longer exists. RIP. Um, and during my set, I don't know, I, I did a mix of maybe Water Noga Enemy with some Tribe Called Quest song and people lost their shit. Like it was a thing. And I was like, oh, okay, this is my regular vibe. Um, and so I remember, you know, people talking about that. Like I think that that cemented an impression of sort of what my DJ personality and sound was going to be like. And back, you know, 98, still not a lot of American folks had heard of Fela, straight up. I don't even remember how I came across this music, but because Fela is James Brown, is Roy Ayers, is everybody, it, the, the through line was there for me as a black American woman from Chicago. I was like, I know those horns. I know that image. I know this. I know that. And it just related, right? So... For me, the Lejadu sisters, it's been such an honor to learn about all the women because Fela was sort of my entry point, right? And then once you go in there and you learn about, and I just wanna say these names, you guys, I think it's really important that we say women's names, particularly black women who have been at the forefront and the foundation of just about everything. Um, and that's just a fact. <laughs> Don't at me. Okay, so, um, First of all, Sandra Isidore, um, I'm sure a lot of you know who that is, but she had a tremendous impact on Fela Kuti. She was part of um, how he was revolutionized beyond his own mother, who Wangeshi's work focuses on. Um, and she is the reason why he dropped the name Ransom. So he was Fela Ransom Kuti, right? Um, and why he picked up an Anakulapo. Um, and... I love knowing that this revolutionary woman who was very aligned with the Black Panthers here in the States while she was in Nigeria and she was just deeply influential on Fela. And I think about the fact that we, Fela might not have been our Fela the way we know him now if it were not for her. Um, and for all the Black women and African women that have influenced him. Um, there's also an artist, Christy Eisen Igbokwe, um, also known as the um, Nigeria Lady of Songs, right? Another revolutionary person in the early 70s making music. Um, Mona Finney, I hope I'm saying that right. Please excuse me butchering people's names. Um, Christy Ogba and the Lijaru sisters. So those are sort of my points of reference and people that I love to mix into my sets because people are like, oh, this sounds like Fela. I'm like, no, Fela sounds like them. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's my one song, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Reborn. Um, so Sanford, you're primarily, I think this is true, identified as a visual artist, but you also have other projects. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit, and I think you have some things to show us as well. So Derek, if you could bring up those slides. Um, if you could talk a little bit about how you came to create Moon Medicine, a project that involves music. Well, uh, 
very similar to Wageshi. I grew up uh, with music being my primary uh, creative outlet. And I played in garage bands all through childhood. And um, even when I started my art career, I was doing video and sound and mixing everything together, even though I was told as a student that I could never mix any of this stuff and that I had to decide what I was gonna do. But it just wasn't, uh, that wasn't my intuitive way of creating. Um, so I started to fuse many things together. And when I finally moved to New York, I still hadn't figured out a way to put the visual and the music together for the art industrial complex, but I knew how to deal with it for New York City. And um, immediately when I got to town, and this is another place that where we would overlap because I used to perform with Saul Williams at CBGB's and I met Tate early on in those days. Um, and we you know, did many lectures and conversations and stuff together after that. But um, I also started to meet uh, the core members of the group Moon Medicine. Mark Hines just walked in here. He's somewhere out there in the mix. Um, and we do a lot of work with Rich Medina. We just did Jump and Funk in Wisconsin two weeks ago. Yeah, that happened. <laughs> um, but um, uh, that question about process, I find very interesting. And I'm very happy not to speak about art today, so I'm not. I'm going to talk about music today. Uh, but that process question, it's similar to that. Um, but when we're doing a performance with Moon Medicine, oh, let me give you, give you that information. This is Moon Medicine up here. It's uh, normally a five-piece band, but we do have some revolving members, people that come in and do guest appearances. We worked closely with Imani Uzuri before, also from San Francisco. Um, and Martin Luther is the lead singer, Jahi Sundance on uh, turntables. Uh, in this set, this was Swiss Chris on drums. Mark Hines on bass, me on keyboards and synths. Um, so I co-compose the music, um, I do artistic direction, and depending on where the gig is, and I'll give you an example of the places we have performed, CBGB's, the Chris Rock Show, a uh, long time ago, but it never got aired, because that was the early days. Um, Art Basel Miami, uh, Kennedy Center, Lincoln Center, the Apollo, um, the Hammer Museum in LA, so we do, Usually one-off or two-off exclusive gigs. Um, uh, the Red Rooster, the box, yeah. Um, the box right when it opened before everyone knew about it. Um, and we do exclusive um, site-specific performance, art, rock, conceptual, funk, jazz, fusion, music. Um, we usually wear a full costume and mask and video is a large part of it. And we usually have our um, audience interventions uh, we might be performing literally seated where you are while you're looking for waiting for the performer to come up and there'll be nothing happening but you're hearing music. We're out there in the audience playing. So we do a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, I'd like to play one song and this sort of demonstrates the process. If we're doing a gig in a certain place, I create a set list that I think is challenging, conceptually interesting. Luckily for us, it's not strictly about pleasing people or getting people up to move. We can rub them the wrong way as long as we can put a little salve on that later. And we like to make it a complicated voyage. And sometimes it's very contrarian. And to that point, I want to play a little bit of um, what, how are we doing for time? OK, all right. So let's play um, I Put a Spell on You. And this is contrarian in a sense. I'll tell you why afterwards. So this uh, play this one. Uh, That's better. Screaming Jay Hawkins. The Screaming Jay Hawkins. Hello. Derek, thank you. Could you uh, could you play the Screaming Jay Hawkins? Yeah, I was like. <laughs> I put a spell on you. Because you're mine. Stop the things you do. <laughs> What's up? Spell on 
Thank you. Thank you. And I, I say that's contrarian because uh, when I thought of that, I thought about that song specifically, and I first went to Alice Smith's version, and then of course I went to Nina Simone's version, and I could probably list 10 other women who've done incredible versions of that, but the one that's the original to my knowledge is actually Screaming Jay Hawkins. And it is performance art. And if you ever see him perform it or images of it, he's full costume coming out of a coffin singing that song. Um, yay. And that kind of vibe, <laughs> that kind of energy, I get from some of Juan Gaethje's work. It's in there, the conjure, you know, the, you know that the thing is happening, you know what I mean? Um, and I say it's contrarian because I could have picked a woman, but I picked a man. So you all have to go and do the research and see all the women who did the song. So that's for you. More labor for women. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking I might do it on your own and keep that. This one you leave here. That one is your take home. You know, just easy. I can totally tease Stanford. I live. That was good. Uh, that no, was but. Good. So, but I'm sorry, just to piggyback on this really quick before we move on. Whenever I hear that version, I can't hear that version and not hear Biggie, which and there's that, that for all the people version was that. sampled for Kick in the Door by Biggie Smalls, exactly. Brooklyn legend, stand up. Exactly. And um, I just, speaking of when she's work, right? If we talk about this idea of collage, this mashup, the reality of it, right? And those aren't the only ways that she presents her work, but this is exactly what we're talking about. Her work is Screaming Jay Hawkins and it's Biggie in the same piece. And Nina. In the and, same piece. and Nina, right? But everything is, it can reference, influence, and still be so unique and still be such, uh, her voice is her own. Um, and I love feeling like the sounds of maybe what she used to create the piece, what I imagine she might be listening to, um, but really see the way that she transcends genre in her presentation of the work and samples. Right. Um, Sanford, did you want to play a little bit of Moon Medicine and then? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll play a clip. Um, we'll yeah, I think you have a clip. Moon song. Medicine is the short clip. It's a teaser. It's a teaser because we don't have our stuff on Spotify yet, but we just pressed a new vinyl that will be available in what just happened? Okay. Um, we just pressed vinyl with Third Man Records and Jack White in uh, Detroit a few months ago, and it will be available probably towards the end of the year, and we will let you all know. Uh, and the album's called The Great Escape, but we will play one teaser track right here. And is that the image that we have? Is that the last slide? Um, I think it is. Just one more. Could you show the next slide, please? And then if you could start the moon medicine. Oh, yeah. There we go. That, that's right. There we go. Oh, and by the way, the artwork is done by Awal Arkizov, um, photographer, artist um, from Los Angeles and New York City. Many of you probably know his work. Lunar Eclipse, Q Lunar Eclipse, Paging Lunar Eclipse. A conceptual piece. <laughs> so you're doing John Cage. Uh, <laughs> Eric, are you are you able to um, tragic magic? No, no, no. Lunar eclipse. It Lunar was a switch, eclipse. Okay. but I think they said they had it. It's the Come on. 
Shout out to Martin Luther. You want to make any comment about that, or is it its own comment? No, I think I'll let it ride. You're good. I want my vinyl. Thanks. Yes, got you. And the jacket. Thanks. <laughs> Um, Reborn, do you have another song? Or do you want to sure. choose? Between the, you yeah. Um, I think um, if we can play, uh, let's do a um, current thing. I, there's a song, uh, Woman, by Little Sims. I don't know if you guys know this artist from the UK, Little Sims. She's an amazing MC, musician, artist, singer. Um, and she has this fantastic song, uh, she has many. Uh, she reminds me a lot of Miss Hill, um, and she's really fantastic. But um, this song in particular, that's shouting out, you know, women from the diaspora and beyond. Um, musically, I think it's pretty great. And the vocals are by one of my favorite singers of right now, Cleo Soul, who's also part of the outfit from the UK that I'm obsessed with called Salt, S A U L T. If you don't know, you should know them. Mm-hmm. And there are many, many brilliant records um so this song you know again and thinking about my guess she and and her work in this moment and you know because i got a rep from my squad woman so that's the one i want to play the little snippet of Got the melanin dripping, L O N D O N C E girl living in the back, looking like fire chili pepper. You rub a girl tougher than imperial leather. He was getting bitter while she was getting better. Diamonds all forever. Miss Sierra Leone looking like a gem. Works hard in the weed party on the weekend. Know you wanna live with no one watching how you spend. Got a thing for the finer things and the finer men. <laughs> Miss Tanzania, she a do or die. Says she wanna know more about the Sakura tribe. We hit the zoo, once wasn't enough. Got a notion full of knowledge, you could scuba dive. Miss Ethiopia can play so jazzy. They sit you down to school, you want Selassie. Tell them you're not and without a woman, no. Woman to woman, I just wanna see you glow. Tell them what's up. Thank you so much. So I, I wonder from, I wanted to ask both of you with your musical work, um, what do you hope audience, audiences experience or take away from your music? Let's start with Stanford. Well, I think primarily inspiration. Um, and within that inspiration, uh, a curiosity. Um, our music very much like uh, my studio practice is really Easter eggs upon Easter eggs upon Easter eggs upon Easter eggs. So um, it's never anything to take at surface level. When you peel one layer back, there's another that presents itself. A lot of it is steeped in history. Musically, it's a lot steeped in musical history as well. References to other musicians, other songs, covers, standards that are reinvented, reimagined. Hopefully you'll shake your booty a little bit, you know, when the time's right. Just a little bit. Um, um, And pleasure. Yeah, pleasure. Uh, So part of uh, my DJ moniker, Reborn, uh, was born out of me trying to decide on a DJ name that felt timeless. Um, I love the the idea of rebirth, but to answer your question, I also thought about how I wanted people to feel after my DJ sets or during them. Um, So, you know, I want people to walk away also inspired, um, very curious about maybe hearing things or being exposed to things that they don't know because our job is to break records and not just play everything that you already know. 
Um, and so inspired, curious, um, in love. Um, um, what else? I feel like maybe a little angry. Honestly, maybe a little angry, right? Because the a big thing for me is making sure that I'm politically representing my voice sonically. Um, and so there might be some things that ruffle feathers, um, not because they're controversial per se, but because they're honest that I play. And honesty um, is, as we all know, something that a lot of people want to hide. So I just, yeah, a little pissed, maybe. Yeah, that's it. That kind of leads into uh, another question I had, which has to do with um, the politics of the dance floor or the concert space. If you could talk a little bit about that and how you see your work contribute, contributing to a kind of conversation about maybe power or politics. Okay, um, could you go back to that slide that showed the band with the uh, text behind it? There we go. So, who knows this song? That is amazing. This is probably the largest showing of hands when I just say that song. I mean, you're not even hearing it, you're just seeing the words. But Lift Every Voice and Sing is otherwise known as the Black National Anthem that was pinned in, I think, 1904. Um, deeply political song, people of a certain age, we used to sing that song in kindergarten, elementary school. We used to do the Pledge of Allegiance and then go right into Lift Every Voice and Sing. Um, so one of our regular members of the group is a gentleman named Andre Simone. He is a guitar and bassist from Minneapolis who developed a sound called the Minneapolis Sound, which he then brought to fruition with a guy named Prince. Um, so. Andre uh, has been a friend for around 20 years and we've been performing for years. And I didn't know this because I've known Andre for years, but I never spoke to him about Prince because it was a very complicated situation. And um, finally, when he started opening up about Prince, it happened because we were in Arizona doing a gig and we were doing a version of Lift Every Voice and Sing, but we used the music from Prince's song, Controversy. So if you imagine the song Controversy, but with a chant, in the original version of Controversy, he says the Lord's Prayer. Conceptually, I said, okay, let's play Controversy and do Lift Every Voice and Sing. And then Andre said, I made up that riff. And that we didn't know. So he made up the da 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 That was Andre. So he's like, I haven't played this song in 30 years, blah, 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 blah. You know? But he's like, I'm in it, so let's do it. So there's that. Um, but back to the political aspect of that, many people don't know that Lift Every Voice and Sing is the song that it is. The first time we ever performed it was here at the box, and I was playing keys. I did a total different arrangement of it. I was wearing a top hat and tails, and there was a porch swing on the stage. And there was two white performers, two white women, wearing Southern Belle dresses, and just swinging on the, uh, the, the porch swing, talking about being slaves. This goes back to Prince. When Prince had that moment with his record contract where he started to wear a slave on the side of his face, there were other musicians who had big deals, but they were alternative musicians, and those major record companies shelved their projects. And when your project is shelved, contractually, you can't make music under your name. So they were slaves too. And Prince told them they were slaves, and they agreed they were slaves. So two of those musicians happened to be on that stage a woman named Estero and a woman named Shea Fiol, and they were singing their version of Lift Every Voice and Sing. Very controversial, this is at the box. Harry Belafonte, rest in peace, was in the audience, and he must have heard that song a thousands of times. He came up afterwards and said that that was his favorite version of it. And we have pictures of him standing with, uh, the, with you know, us in costume, the whole thing. So back to that notion of anger and po politics and all that. Uh, moon medicine is a way for me to deal with those in a very different way than in visual arts. Uh, when I deal with it in visual arts, it gets really controversial and people get real hot. In music, people get upset, but they can switch up because music does so many things so fast. And I find that's sort of necessary for me to express as an artist. That's why I vacillate between those two, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, Part of 
my process that I didn't talk about that I've been doing for a long time is uh, sometimes I will use the instrumental of a song that I find particularly offensive <laughs> uh, lyrically. Um, and if the beat is excellent or I feel like it has its own weight enough, I will use the instrumental as an underpinning for another vocal or something else. So this is part of my collage process in DJing. Um, so that is sort of one way politically that I like to extend what I do in front of audiences. Um, so they're like, oh, that beat is from so-and-so, but that's not, those are not the lyrics, right? So um, that's a part of it. And then I don't know if this really answers your question, but I'm, I'm thinking so much about a couple of months ago when I was in Europe and um, I had the fortune of DJing in Italy uh, in a small city called Bari, if you know Italy, um, Bari and then Naples. But one of the things that came up was the party was called BUG, and it was an acronym for Black Urban Grooves, um, lovely collective of people, none among them black. Um, and once I did the math and I figured out that not only was no one black involved in the presentation of something called black urban grooves. I realized my trigger as a black American to hear urban and anything together. Um, so that was nice. And then I went to the party and of course we're in a small Italian town. I didn't expect to see a lot of people of color um, and I did not. Uh, but I, you know, there were a couple, right? So, um, but the, the guy who got me the gig, this wonderful guy, Nico, um, he and I had a conversation afterwards because they got me some press and it was a beautiful night. The music was great. The audience was awesome. They were lovely and wonderful. But I walked away from that feeling like politically for me, because I'm building a relationship with this promoter, I wanted him to know how um, critical it is for me to know that there are efforts being made to promote to any black and brown people wherever we book something. Those are my politics, right? So it's like you're going to have to work a little bit harder and not just be satisfied with the fact that it's a good turnout. Who's in the room? How are you doing a party called Black Urban Grooves and I'm the only black person in the room, <laughs> right? Presenting those black urban groups. Um, so I was like, y'all gotta get somebody on your team. <laughs> you have to promote in areas. We're in Italy, we're not in outer space. I see a black guy on the dance floor. He's got family here, what's going on? We're everywhere. So I just, I feel like for me, I'm not uh, like interested in going for like an okie doke of optics not matching or not being diverse, right? Like, it doesn't have to look exactly like me, but I gotta see me, or somebody that looks like me at all times with anything having to do with us. So I just make that, you know, people that book me, I love playing music for everyone, and I play all genres of music. But, you know, like I said, my squad got a rep. So that's my politics for that. Okay, so we're gonna turn it over to you. Um, I think Austin will help with. So if you have a question or comment, please, now's the time. Uh, hi there, everybody. Um, big question, um, is there a playlist for the Wengichi, Gechi show? And are you guys represented in that playlist? Um, and is it you know something that we can digitally um, access as we walk through the show, um, because music and art should go together. I think Austin can probably speak on the playlist because <laughs> they're the one who put it together. <laughs> yeah, so for this uh, program, we put together a playlist, which both Sanford and Reborn have contributed a little bit to. Um, it wasn't built for the exhibition specifically, but more so this program. Um, but we will be giving uh, that link out um, after after the program. Yes. Yes, yeah. And um, it's actually playing in the lobby today as well. Um, oh. Oh, wonderful. Let's chat after. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
any other questions or comments? Uh, thank you. you. You broadened out my view of a, a lot of these different questions you spoke of. Uh, my name is Andy Z. I'm the spokesperson of Revolution Books in New York. And many years ago, um, uh, Fela was in prison, and I was very involved in uh, a campaign to get him released from prison, which after a lot of work we did, and he came to New York, and we spent a day together. And I think one of the things he emphasized was musicians and artists taking risks, and taking risks not just for their art, but taking risks for society. Because he'd already seen his mother thrown off the balcony of the house, killed. His mother, who was a friend of Mao Zedong. Uh, and Fela, you know, insisted on this, because we were like really concerned. We didn't think he'd get out of jail, actually. And, you know, today when we have a situation where vigilantes are approved from the highest offices of the land and the media, and people stand aside and see a yes, troubled, ill, but nonetheless amazing man who could do a moon dance, not on a polished floor, but on a gritty subway platform. I think it's time for artists to take some incredible risks, looking at the future of the planet, the future of the people, the future of different races of people, different genders, really are at stake. And so I thought um, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more about that, that question in terms of a challenge to artists, uh, musicians, to really look at the world and uh, the way Wangichi does, and then to also take those risks, not just for our art, but for humanity. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I necessarily have a comment to that, per se, but I do have... Um examples within my own practice um, where I try to deal with some things. And, you know, our work can only do so much in one given time, and each project is its project, of course, and it's an ongoing struggle. But, oh, and also, quick sidebar, have you heard of what's going on with Seyun Kuti? Okay. I don't know. I don't know. The last I heard was that he was being held um, in Nigeria. Yeah. Um, anyway. Um, I recently did a project um, also with Mark Hines and the Chase and Art Museum in University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, where we basically did a two-year deep dive looking at the um, Lincoln Emancipation Group sculpture, where he is basically has his hand above a formerly enslaved person and, a hand, yeah, and basically freeing them, and he's a great uh, no, emancipator. Uh, you know the pieces, a Thomas Ball piece. There are several versions everywhere. They just pulled one down in Boston. Um, they're debating pulling one down from D.C. Um, I think there's one here. Is there one at the Schomburg? There's one at the Schomburg. There's one at the University of Wisconsin. And they wanted to tuck that away and hide it because, you know, the um, reckoning was happening and everybody was pulling, you know, uh, uh, protesting the monuments and so on. So they wanted to hide it. They basically were, you know, let's get this out of here. We're sort of ashamed that it's here, the whole thing. And we convinced them that really the charge of a university is to actually dialogue about this thing. Don't put it away. Put it out. Let's talk to the English department, the history department, the art department, African-American studies, whatever studies. Bring them all in. Let's have conversations about this. So that started a two-year project where we basically had um, interviews and video testimonies and people from all over the campus come and talk about the piece. That then later opened up to us bringing in uh, Rich Medina, uh, Keon Harold, uh, Farrell Monch, different poets, different MCs, different artists to come in and give their impression about the piece. And we did a huge video of that that is also displayed in the exhibition. The exhibition itself is largely a sort of a didactic ped pedagogical piece that goes through a timeline of their collection and other objects that they have that meet certain important dates along the U.S. historical timeline and in relationship to the Emanson, uh, the Lincoln sculpture. Then finally, uh, and we just unveiled this two weeks ago, I did a, um, a, a marble piece that is basically riffing off of Lincoln being the emancipator, but in this version, it's Frederick Douglass standing up and Lincoln is sitting down and Frederick Douglass is pulling the veil of ignorance off of Lincoln's head. So basically, 
And as many people know, historians know, Lincoln and Douglas had conversations and dialogue for many years. After Lincoln dies, the Emancipation Group sculpture is revealed, and Douglas, right there, that day it was unveiled, critiqued it. He analyzed it and broke it down, say, while this is tremendous, it is not really displaying us the way we need to be portrayed, and so on. So that happened, I want to say, it was, uh, what year was that? Is that 18, 1880? 1865. 73. OK, so around then, basically, because there are several different iterations of this piece. Um, but yeah, so that just happened. A lot of press about it, but more important than the press. And the press is important because when we made this project, it really wasn't just about that object at that museum. It was this as a pedagogical approach for many institutions to find an alternative to deal with problematic works. And I'm not saying that this is the only way to do it, but this is a way to do, do it as opposed to let's hide it or let's destroy it. Because either way you erase it and then you erase the history and you only leave it ripe to be repeated. And the whole point is we have to dialogue and provide context so these things don't happen again. Um, so in a small way, I think this is addressing part of that, um, you know, and once again, other projects will happen. There's more to do. The struggle continues, but yeah. We have time for one more question. Uh, any other questions? Hi, thank you. Um, just a preface, I'm really anxious right now, so that's why my, I might start like stuttering a little bit. But anyways, um, my question is mostly related to being like a young black art artist. Um, and I think there was so much knowledge that was shared in the room today, but I also feel bad sometimes because I'm like, wow, like how do I get access to this knowledge, you know? Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, and I'm wondering, what do you think that we both as like the younger generation, and I don't want to say the older generation, but the more knowledge generation can do to like share that knowledge? I'm so nervous. It's okay. You're doing it. You all good. You all good. It's the microphone. It's the microphone. I swear. It's <laughs> um, but I guess what can we do to like share that knowledge and kind of create that space where those stories are shared? Because I think it's one thing to read about it in like an art textbook, you know, any type of textbook really, but then to come here and like hear these stories from a more personal perspective really changes things for me. Um, and like I'm inspired to go back and do work and, and do what I have to do, you know? But yeah, thank you. My name is Sally, by the way, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> thank you, Sally. <laughs> what did you say your name is again? Sully, C L L Y. Sully Mata is S A L I M A T A. What a beautiful name! Thank you. I, I say, you know, I would like to hear that more. Um, but first of all, thank you for your question and. Um, First of all, your nerves totally went away. I, you, were, you were super clear. You're obviously extremely vibrant. I'm curious about what your particular art is, and we can talk about that later. But um, um, I just think for young artists, it's really critical. I mean, first of all, you just being here today is a thing. Do you know what I'm saying? So you found out about this, and you're here. I don't know what your relationship is. Oh, thank you, friend or person. Boyfriend, you know, I don't, <laughs> aw, okay, so anyway, um, so uh, I just feel like you guys being here, right, and you being curious enough to ask the question is how we get what we need, right, so my parents used to say, uh, what is it, uh, closed mouth don't get fed, <laughs> right, so um, thank you for wanting to be fed, the, the main thing is continuing to come to things like this engaging artists who are more experienced than you. I always find too, you can never underestimate how open a lot of us artists are. Um, if I get messages from people who are young women who are like, I really wanna learn how to DJ, what do you recommend? And I'm like, come over and I'll show you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, And so it, reaching out to people that influence your work or that you feel moved by or inspired by, 
I'm not saying you're always going to get a response or an interaction, but it's definitely worth it. And more often than not, you will find that you have access to people and their information and um, their resources. So keep asking questions. Go to all the things. Send people messages. It was nice meeting you at the museum. And, you know, whatever. Like, I want to stay in touch. Here's my work. Is it okay if I send you a sample of my work? Like, whatever that is to people. So I just think keep reaching out and keep using your voice. It's beautiful. I also wanted to add, um, there are living people, you know, but I, I think one of the resources that I love is oral histories because through oral histories, you learn about someone's life and things beyond what they just produce, but their lived experience and how it translates into their work. So I think that's always a great resource short of a seance, being able to, you know, <laughs> access the histories of people who are no longer living, but also, you know, there are plenty of um, living people who also have oral histories and. I think it's a, it's a great way to tap into some of that creative potential. We have time for one more question. If there is one more question. If, if there's not, I'll, I'll play one more track. I saw, I saw a hand. It's a good outro. We can actually play that as we, we can play the whole thing okay. as we go out. Um, Alice Coltrane? But no, but let's, let's get oh, the Alice. question first and then. Okay, perfect. All right. No, I, actually, it's not a question. It's more a comment to answer, to answer Salimata. Um, because I was going to talk and then I said no. Uh, I have an early story. I'm much older than you. Could be your grandmother. But uh, my first awakening with music, beside my mother playing piano, and being dis uh, totally ridiculed by my father. My brother, the f when I was six years old, my brother introduced me to Miles Davis and John Coltrane in a little town in France. I don't know how he got access to that. And Dave Brubeck, I mean, he loved jazz. And then he became involved in a jazz group. So that was that. When I came to New York, well, already in France, you know, we have a lot of clubs, and we used to go clubbing and dance all night with great DJs. And that's when I heard Sugar Hill first in Paris in the 70s. So I go way back. And then when I came to New York, it was a series of clubs like the Mud Club, then uh, uh, Max Kansas City, and so on. And then uh, Aria, and you had Density Area, Aria. You had so many clubs where the best DJs and where you had all the B-boys coming to, <laughs> to roller skate every Tuesday. I remember the Roxy. So we had a, an amazing DJs. With the, we, we could hear hip hop right there and then, back then before it was mainstream and destroyed. Well, excuse me, but kind of destroyed. Very becoming like a money making machine and no longer a very revolutionary and very um, breaking, the, breaking the rules, you know, with everything we knew, starting with Public Enemy, KIS1, etc. So I just wanted to share that experience, but one thing I want to mention to, well, it's for I know, but to DJ Reborn is I used to go dance, I have many friends DJs, and I used to go dance, including Junior Basquez and Larry Levan at the Paradise Garage, so that was an experience. <laughs> Larry Levan was a master of making a mix with one turntable, a North Star. <laughs> And he w we were not allowed to drink, but everybody was high, except me, because <laughs> I never used drugs, but I was high on music. And you would dance, you would go into a trance. The idea of going out and dancing all night, and I would dance all night, and then have breakfast at seven o'clock in the morning at Kiev, back in the days of Dave's Corner, after the Mod Club. So we have a whole, you know, that was the 80s. And everything was mixed with art. I mean, Jean-Michel Basquiat came from that. He was my friend, and he was there. They, uh, Keith Haring, all these, uh, Kenny Scharf, you name them all, including Robert Longo, and, uh, you know, and uh, George Kondo, et cetera. But the, uh, the idea was really to get into trance. And so my, 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 one of my best friends, DJ, was, is Johnny Dinell. He still is. And um, 
He used to say, Brigitte, I have to educate the audience. They want this, they want that. No, I have to bring them new ideas, break it into their head so they can dance and they can learn something new and they can get into it. So that's a response to you. So it's not really a question. I want to share my experience. But I had many trans nights dancing all night, and everybody knew me for that, including Jean-Michel, and he would be like, can I dance with you a little? I said, come, because <laughs> I don't care. I was dancing. <laughs> so I think the note of trance uh, on the dance floor is a good place to, to wrap things up. And I think just um, going out, we can play the, one of the songs that Sanford um, selected. So could you tell us a little bit about the song? And then I want to ask if, if there's something you want to say about it. Yeah, just really quickly. I mean, you'll hear it. Um, probably won't be here long enough to really go into the full trance of it all because it is significant. But um, it is on the playlist that will be supplied afterwards. So you can do a deeper dive. Um, it is a very influential song for me, but it is a song that I hear, you know, that question you asked about what songs you hear when you see Juan Gacy's work, and that is one of sort of like always in the background of everything I've seen of hers in my mind. Um, and then there's the Betty Davis and all the stuff that we're popping up, but this journey into Sacha Dananda is sort of like permeating the whole vibe in my thoughts. But okay. so we're going to go out with Alice Coltrane, but before so and um, Derek, if you could please cue up that song. But before we play the song, I want you all to join me in thanking our wonderful panelists, uh, Reborn and Stanford. And can I just add a, a special shout out to Wageshi, who's not here with us, of course, but uh, just for bringing us together and for her work being so deeply driving and inspiring to, I think, everybody in the room. So shout out to Wageshi.